This is a story about a challenge. Actually, a few of them. See, a client reached out and said they had some walnut lumber that they had milled from a tree that was on their property. They lived in an old farmhouse and they were selling the farm and remodeling a house in the city. They wanted a table to remember the farm by. Enter me. The stock was all rough sawn and five quarter at most. The client wanted twin turned pedestals for the base and breadboard ends on the tabletop. The walnut was air dried, which is great. The problem was, there's only so much of it and I needed to get all of my parts out of it. See, air dried walnut and kiln dried walnut are slightly different in color. They don't match if you put them side by side and air dried walnut is hard to come by when you need it. So I took the job. Once I got back to my shop, I looked at the pile for a bit, scared to get started because I didn't have enough material to screw up, not to mention the sentimental value of the lumber. After I scrutinized over where I would get each piece from, I started cutting the pieces down and milling them up. I decided I would prioritize the top since that's the most shown and I was able to discern the sequence of each board from the log, which was really exciting because that meant I could bookmatch them. After jointing, planing, and ripping all the pieces, I cut some slots for biscuits and started gluing up the tabletop. After the top was in clamps, I cleaned up the squeeze out with some walnut sawdust from the milling operations. It's a bit messy, but seems to help soak up the glue for easy sanding later, rather than spreading it with a damp rag. Then I added calls to each end to try to get the top to dry as flat as possible. It's when I took a step back, I started to get excited. The book matched planks mirrored each other in a way that I started seeing faces. In this section, I see a great horned owl. Once I took it out of the clamps, I was really happy to see the top came out dead flat. I threw it on a rolling cart and wheeled it out of the way for a bit. I knew I wouldn't have the stock for the pedestals out of full width boards, so I focused next on making some blanks for the feet and top supports. I wanted to make them 8 inches wide, so I jointed an edge, then ripped the rough sawn down to 8 inches to fit my jointer. Then I joined to the face and plane the opposite face. Doing it in this order is a little backwards for normal milling operations, but it works. I glued up all four blanks at once and stacked them next to each other to maximize the efficiency of my clamps since I knew I would need a lot for the next step. At this point, I was definitely going to need to supplement the build with some air dried walnut from my personal stock. I knew I had a little when I started the build, but wasn't sure if it would cover what I needed. I dug through my collection and pulled out any piece that would be long enough for the pedestals. Some were three quarters and some were two inches thick. I stacked them all together and used an eight inch circle I cut out of paper until I had a combination that would fit the bill. Then I made two huge laminations knowing the next big challenge was ahead of me, turning the pedestals. Turning things this big and heavy is scary, frankly. They're out of balance, they're each about 40 pounds and spinning at, say, 600 RPMs, it's, it's enough to make you flinch. To get a faceplate as centered as possible, I used a spur center in what I determined the center point to help line up the faceplate. I think I use pocket hole screws for everything but pocket holes. Their pan head helps pull down whatever you're trying to screw down, and they're case hardened, so they have less chance of snapping or shearing the last thing you'd want to happen when turning something like this. Once I had the plate mounted, I awkwardly got a pedestal mounted on the lathe. I started up the lathe and turned up the speed until it started to wobble. With a pedestal on the lathe and spinning, if I said I wasn't a little apprehensive about sticking a lathe tool into something with that much force, I'd be lying. But once I made the first few cuts, I gained confidence. If you watch this channel with any regularity, you know Grizzly Industrial and I have a pretty good relationship, and I honestly don't think I could have gotten this job done without this lathe. This is the G0733 18x47 lathe, and it's incredible. I hope this turning speaks for itself. The only thing I was limited by was my skill. 
And right now, Grizzly is offering 10% off this and some other machines you see in my shop. I'll leave a link in the description to everything the code Walker10 is valid for at grizzly.com. All right, back to turning. After turning one base, a challenge in itself, I needed to turn a second matching base. Stressful. I put the first pedestal on some stands directly behind the one I was turning to try to match the profile as best I could. It was nerve-wracking. As I removed material, some voids became apparent, so I would lock the spindle, tape up the low spots, and fill with charcoal tinted epoxy. When I finished a pedestal, I would sand it on the lathe, then trim the ends to the exact height I needed the pedestals to be, and cut the last little nub off with a Japanese saw. To ensure the base components sat flat on top and bottom, I took down any high spots with a belt sander. It's pretty cool to see the contrast of before and after the turning. With the pedestals turned, I could take a brief sigh of relief and turn my attention back to the top. The boards had some voids and defects that needed filling so crumbs and dirt wouldn't collect in them. I did put most of the offending defects on the underside of the table, so I taped off any hole or gap I could see on the top and flipped it over. I use a two-part epoxy, and I like these pump systems that take the measuring out of the equation. I tint my epoxy with an artist charcoal that I get on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description to stuff that I use around the shop for anyone curious. A little charcoal goes a long way. While the epoxy dried, I started working on the feet. During the turning process, I decided I was going to add an inch in thickness to the feet to give it more of a sculpted look, so I glued on another piece and used my favorite drinking straw glue cleanup tip. I cut a template out of some scrap quarter inch plywood and traced it on the feet and then took them to the bandsaw. I refined the shape with chisels and then ultimately a belt sander to smooth out the inside and outside curves, though that footage was lost somewhere along the way. To connect the base pieces across the length of the table, I needed to pull some more stock off the rack for the upper and lower stretchers. The upper stretcher would be two inches thick and the lower three. For the upper stretcher, I wanted to dovetail it in for extra strength and to ensure it was flush against the underside of the top. I first laid out a one to eight ratio tail, then decided the angle needed to be steeper. I set up a stop on the bandsaw and cut close to my line. I finished the cut with a handsaw, then cleaned up my lines with a chisel. It's a shame this joint will never be seen by anyone but you, but I traced the tail onto the top supports and cut to my line, much like I'd cut for half blinds. Though this will be covered by a top. Does that make it a full blind dovetail? Anyway, I chiseled out some waste, then grabbed a router to hog out the rest. I cleaned up the walls of the dovetail mortises and glued in the tails. For the feet and bottom stretcher, I knew I needed to pick the stretcher up off the floor, so I opted for a classic mortise and tenon. I laid out my mortise lines, then hogged up the bulk with a Forstner bit and the drill press. I cut the tenons on my table saw using a quarter inch dado stack. I only used a quarter inch stack because I was only cutting two tenons, and I was going to need the quarter inch stack for one of the next steps and didn't feel like fooling with changing chippers for just two tenons. I cleaned up my mortises with a chisel until I had a nice fit to the tenon, and I added glue to the mortise and tenons and put them together. A well-fitted mortise and tenon is something truly satisfying. 
It wasn't until this moment I realized this piece was bigger than my longest clamp. It wouldn't have been so stressful if I had realized ahead of time, so here's a pro tip. You can gang up your clamps to clamp against each other when you're in a pinch, effectively almost doubling your clamp's capacity. With all of the pieces starting to come together, one of the last pieces of the puzzle were the breadboard ends. So I started cleaning up the top to get ready for those. The purpose of a breadboard end is to keep the tabletop flat but also allow for expansion and contraction of the wood during seasonal changes. It's like a combination of haunched mortise and tenons and tongue and groove. I started cutting the tongue or tenon, however you like to look at it, by taking passes with a router and a straight bit along a fence clamped to the top. I recently got this Stanley 78 plane in working order and this was a perfect project for it. I checked the shoulder of the tenon part of the breadboard to the actual breadboard and marked any small gaps. Then I could use the 78 as a shoulder plane and trim to get the perfect fit. Once I was happy with the shoulders of the joint, I could use a piece of scrap to test the fit of the groove or the mortise. This fit is subjective. You want it to be snug but not so tight you risk splitting along the grain. This is summer though, so I'd like a tighter fit than looser as the wood contracts in the winter. Now to cut the tenons. The tenons are 3 eighths of an inch thick, so I left the haunch at 3 eighths to help keep the table flat, while the mortise and tenons should support the weight of anyone leaning on the end of the table. I hope that makes sense. With all of the tenons cut, I could mark locations for the mortises. I noted the edges of the tenons, then drilled out the mortises at the drill press with a 3 8 inch bit. I was sure to leave room on either side of the tenon to allow the tenon to swell with wood movement. Then I cleaned up the mortises with a chisel. Do you see a trend yet? I tested the fit of the breadboards with taps from a small mallet. You don't want to have to beat on the ends too hard, that's a sign something is too tight. This is a mostly mechanical joint though, so I wanted it to be snug. This is why I call the joint subjective. It's hard to describe the right feel, other than you know when it's right. Once I had a good fit, I drilled some 3 8 inch holes in the breadboard end and refit it over the tenons. I was going to be draw boring these tenons, which is a mechanical way of drawing the breadboard tight to the tabletop. After indexing the breadboard holes to the tenons with the 3 8 inch brad point bit, I removed the breadboard. With my bit in drill, I found those reference marks and moved the bit about a sixteenth of an inch closer to the shoulder of the joint. This will help draw the breadboard into the top through the board holes, hence the name draw board. One thing to note is how I'm reaming out the hole side to side, again to allow for seasonal movement. I needed some dowels, so I cut some straight grained walnut, and I used my shop made dowel plate inspired by Neil Paskin of Pask Makes. I tapered the end of the dowels at the sander, then added glue to only the center two dowels and drove them in. Note how the dowel starts off plumb, then gets kicked out of whack, then writes itself again. That is the dowel bending itself around the offset hole of the tenon and back into alignment on the other side of the breadboard. On the outline dowels, I drove them in and only added a little bit of glue on the final few taps to hold the dowel into the breadboard, but leave the tenon free to float within the groove. After both breadboards were installed, I made everything nice and pretty with my Bedrock 604 smoothing plane. Then flushed off the long ends of the breadboards. I'm recycling this shot of me sanding from before because the actual sanding is part of the same lost footage I mentioned earlier. I'm sure my sanding footage lives on an island somewhere growing old with all those socks belonging to someone's left foot. Scraping is where it's at anyway. I hand scrape the top and believe me when I say you really can't beat the finish off a card scraper. It's so much faster and comes out glassy. The client asked me to sign the piece and of course I obliged. I recently picked up this branding iron from Cranford Design and I want to use it on everything. Finally, it was time to apply finish. I'm using Armor Seal and check out this book matched flame crotch figure when the oil hits it. Man, I love that. To put the base pieces together, I drilled about halfway through the top supports and feet with a large Forstner bit, then drilled all the way through with a bit that would accept long lag screws. I used that same stepped hole method for mounting the tabletop, except I elongated the holes to allow for wood movement. I positioned the pieces over the pedestals and used a drill bit to transfer the hole locations. 
I drove the lags in on the top and bottom supports, then I checked the tabletop mounts. Then I had my buddy come over and help me load and deliver the table. The client isn't in their new home yet, they're in a rental until construction is complete, but had a room that it would fit in. I can't wait to see this table in its permanent home. I saw the plans of where it's going and it will be in a big open area in front of a big window with lots of natural light. I will definitely have to follow up on this table when it's in its forever home. This project was full of challenges, one after another, but really isn't that what makes us better at our craft? To challenge our thought process, raise the stakes a little, and push us outside of our comfort zones? I like to think so at least. Let me know what you think of this twin-turned-pedestal-breadboard-ended walnut dining table. I've got to come up with a better name for it than that, but I think it turned out quite nice. Thanks for watching.